It's working. Right, let me get to the message. I just moved it down so that it doesn't um, act up. If it's way up, that's why it acts up. So move it down. It don't act up like it did. Amen. Take your Bibles and stand if you can. Turn to Psalm 119. And we'll take turns reading the whole psalm. Just kidding. you will be standing for a long time if you read the whole psalm. There's only 176 verses. But we're only going to read one. Verse 133. Verse 133. It says, Order my steps in thy word, and let not any iniquity have dominion over me. I want to focus on the first part of that verse. Order my steps in thy word. We're going to start a series tonight entitled, Order My Steps in Thy Word. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're coming for it. We thank you for your love, your mercy, and grace. Lord, we pray that you'll meet with us today. I pray that you'll help us, Lord, to learn to order our steps in your word. Help us to become people of your word, directed by your word, yielded to your word, so that you can get all the honor and all the glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. And so, as God's people, to be a people of God, we must be people of his word. If we're not people of his word, then we're not going to be the kind of people that are representing the holy God. We're not going to be the ambassadors that we're supposed to be. Right? We're ambassadors. What does it mean to be an ambassador? We, we represent him. Right? When you have an ambassador of the United States in another country, they're still citizens of the United States, right? But they're in that country, and while they're in that country, they're representing us. Now, in the world, you might have some good ambassadors. You might have some bad ambassadors. Right? They're not very good representatives of the United States. And so here on this earth, every child of God is an ambassador. Now, we can, we can either be a, a good ambassador, and we, we represent in Christ, and we're showing other people Christ, and they're seeing him and not us, or we can be not so good an ambassador, and they see us, right? If they, if they see us, then that's not going to help them very much, right? They're not going to be stirred up spiritually. They're not going to want wonder and be curious about the things of God. But if we're good ambassadors, and they see Christ then they're going to be spoken to through our lives. And so this first part of Order My Steps in That Word is called getting prepared to read God's Word. Getting prepared to read God's Word. Now, I sort of like what Brother Clark said about reading the Bible and studying the Bible, right? We have a time that we just read. Now, I always take notes, right? I, I never just read. I can't. It's impossible for me. I can't, I can't just read. So I always take notes. When I'm reading the Bible, I always have my, my binder, and I always have the date, and I always put down what I read, what, chap what book, what chapter, and then whatever verses that the Lord speaks to me, I just write it down. I, I don't at that. That's not studying to me. The, having a notebook and just writing something down, that's not studying. That's still part of reading, right? Studying is when you dive into it. What does that word mean? What's this word mean? What did it say before that verse? What did it say after that verse? Maybe what uh, uh, previous chapters does it say? What does it say after? Right? That's that you're digging in, you're studying. What's it mean in the Greek? What's it mean in the Hebrew? Right? Then you're you're really studying the Word of God. And so, but we should have a time of when we're just reading, right? A lot of times my messages come from what I've written down in my binder. So, you know, as, so I have some right now. I haven't studied yet. But I have stars by it saying I need to study that. That I need to study. The God's people might need that. Right? And so, but when God says, okay, now it's time to study that, then I go back and I study that because God puts it on my heart. Hey, go back there. and But if I didn't write down, Brother Moore, I, 
I'd forget. I'd forget, right? If I if I don't write it down, I forget the next day, Brother Chuck. I'm like, what what, what if what did he say? What what did I, what did I read? I have to go back and read it again. And so here's some things about getting prepared to read the Word of God. Number one is you have to get to know God first. You have to get to know God first. Look over at Job chapter 22. Job 22. There's a fly up here. I'm taking it away. Job 22 verses 21 and 22. It says, Acquaint now thyself with him, and be at peace. Thereby good shall come unto thee. Receive, I pray thee, the law from his mouth, and lay up his words in thine heart. You all know who that's talking about? God. Look at verse 21. Acquaint now thyself with him. What's it mean to get acquainted with somebody? To get to know them, right? You're getting acquainted. You're getting to know one another. Well, here it says, acquaint now thyself with him. Acquaint now thyself with God. It says, hey, get to know him. Get to know who he is. Get to know his attributes. Get, get to know his requirements. Get to know how. what does it take to receive the blessings of God. What, what does it take to please the Lord with our lives? Hold your place in Job and look over at Psalm. Psalm 1. Psalm 1, verse 1. Someone tell me the first word. Anybody there? Blessed blessed. So he's getting ready to tell us how we as God's people can be blessed. Blessed. Blessed is the man. Now that word man there, ladies, doesn't let you off the hook. That word man there is mankind. So it's talking to all of us. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. So first of all, to be blessed, you have to be separated from the world. So we learned that in, in uh, 2 Corinthians 6, verse 17, come out from London, be you separate, being separate from who? The world, right? So this verse here doesn't have the word separate in it, doesn't have the word separation in it, but the principle is to be separate, separate from the world. Look at verse 2, second way to be blessed. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. So the second, the first way to be blessed is to be separate from the world. The second way to be blessed is to delight in the word of God. To, to meditate upon it. What does it mean to meditate? Think about it. Now meditating is part of study. Right? When you're reading, you're just reading, and you're, you're getting through it. But, but meditating is part of study. You're thinking about what God is saying. You're thinking about who is God addressing. What principle, what biblical principle is he trying to teach me? Is there a doctrine that I need to learn here? You're asking those questions. That's meditating upon the word of God. Verse 3, And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Right? So if you are severed from the world, and you delight in the word of God, and you meditate upon the word of God day in and day out, he says you're going to prosper. You're, you're going to be blessed. He lays it right out. We don't have to wonder. Well, I wonder how I can have the blessings of God. He tells us. We don't, we don't have to wonder. Just like when we were lost, we don't have to wonder, how can I go to heaven when I die? Do I have to be good? Do I have to go to church? Do I have to get baptized? 
Do I have to give all my money to the church? What, what do I have to do to go to heaven? He lays it out in his word. Believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Right? He puts it clear. And so uh, we have to get to know our God. Acquaint now thyself with him. Then it says, and be at peace. Well, how are you going to be at peace? Because you're acquainting yourself with your God. See, he's not everybody's God. He's only your God if you're born again. He's not everybody's God. You have to be born again. Right? And so if you're born again tonight, you should be acquainting yourself with him so that he can be Lord of your life. So you can be saved, but him not being the Lord of your life. That's another decision you have to make. If you're saved tonight, you already made the best decision you could ever make in your life. Because if you're saved tonight, you're not going to hell when you die. But there's another decision that every born-again believer has to make. They have to decide, am I going to make him Lord of my life? If he, is he going to be in control of my life? Is he going to lead me? Is he going to guide me? Is he going to call the shots? Or am I going to call the shots? Right? So you have to make a second choice after you get saved. You have to decide, do I want him to be Lord of my life? Now, he's Lord no matter what. He's, he's Lord whether you decide to make him Lord of your life. He's Lord. Now, when a, when a, a believer decides, well, you know what? I, I am not going to make that choice. Now, they, they might, Brother Moore, they might not say that out loud. They might not ever say, no, I'm not going to make you Lord of my life. They just do that by action. Right? By action, they say, with their lives, with how they live, they say, I'm not going to make him Lord of my life. By not yielding to him. By not letting him be in control of their lives. And guiding them in this life. So you have to make him Lord of your life. When you do that, you'll want to acquaint yourself with him. You'll want to get to know him really well. Then you'll have peace. Thereby good shall come unto thee. Not only will you have peace, but he'll be good to you. He'll be good. Good shall come unto you. Verse 22, receive, I pray thee, the law from his mouth. So if you're acquainting yourself with him and you're at peace and good is coming to you, then it says that you'll receive his word and lay up his words in your what? In thine heart. Right? That was just in Psalm 119. Hide thy word, thy word in my... In your, let's go there. I'm getting tongue, tongue twisted. Hold your face in Job. Is that verse 11? Verse 11. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. So when you're acquainting yourself with the Lord... And you're, he's giving you peace and he's, he's sending good to you and you're receiving his word and you're laying up in your heart. Then the Bible says you won't go against God. You won't go against God. So we have to get to know God. In order to understand God's word, you must understand the author. He's the author. God is the author. The Bible is not just another book. It's God's book. It's spiritual. You need to have a relationship with the Lord to understand the book. The book is there to guide you. The book is there to correct you. The, the book is there to comfort you and encourage you to show you what God wants you to do. So in Jude, Joe 22, there's a challenge for us to get acquainted with God to receive peace in his words. Now, here are some principles. Let me give you some principles about God. That everyone must recognize to be able to understand this word. Just four principles. Number one, God created everything and he is in charge. God created everything and he is in charge. I'm not in charge. You're not in charge. If we think we are in charge, God will show us real quick that we're not. He will. 
You think, okay. He'll say, okay, you think you think you got this. You think you're in charge. Let me show you that you're not. Now, he won't do that to the lost. He's not their God. Satan is their God. But for us as his people, if we think that we can be in charge, he's going to deal with his children. He, he's going to show his children, no, you're, you're not. You're not in charge. Look at, at Psalm 100. Psalm 100 and verse 3. It says, Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us. And not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Sometimes we forget God created us. We didn't create God. God created us. Amen. He created everything. And there's another place I don't have it written down right now. So we were created for his pleasure. This is in Revelation 10, I think. 11, somewhere in there. But we were, we were created for his pleasure. Not for our pleasure. Not for us. Not, not to do what we want to do with our lives. What does God want us to do with our lives? Do you know that if you do what you want to do with your life, you're accepting second best. But if we do what, what God wants us to do with our lives, that's first best. There's nothing better than what God wants for us. Because God wants what's best for us. How do you find the will of God? You better pray. You better be in his word. Because the only way to find the will of God is through the Holy Spirit. Well, we just learned about this past weekend. We must be filled with the Spirit of God. And if we're not filled with the Spirit of God, we can't find the will of God. Because that's a spiritual thing. You have to have the mind of God to know what God wants you to do. Well, to have the mind of God, you have to be what? Filled with the Spirit. To know that. Therefore, God must be in charge. Not our sinful nature. See that sinful nature? It's still there. Brother Clark touched on that. Your flesh did not get saved. And you will deal with your flesh till you leave this world. That's why Paul says, I die daily. That's why Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. That's why Romans 7, where it talks about the battle that's inside, that the believer has two natures now, the flesh and the spirit. And they fight each other, and they fight each other. Every single day they fight each other. Right? And so we have to realize, my sinful nature can't be in charge. Because through my sinful nature, I will distort what God is trying to say in his word. You have to have the spirit of God to understand the word of God. Our sinful nature will not understand this book. And if we read this book or study this book in the flesh, you will not have right doctrine. You will get wrong meaning from them. That's why there's so many different doctrines in the world today. That's why there's so many different denominations in the world today because someone studied in the flesh. That's why you have corrupt word of God. That's why we're King James only. The King James only we're, the King James is the word of God for the English speaking people. All others is corrupt. And it's because of someone's sinful nature that we have other so called versions of the word of God. They should, they should take the class that I took in, in Bible college. It's called the Canon of the Scriptures. So that you can understand how we got the King James Bible. And how all the other ones came onto the scene. It's not good, right? It's not good. It's, it's called West Cotton Hort. And those were bad guys. I don't even think they were even saved, Brother Chuck. Those were bad guys. They did not care about the Word of God. It wasn't, that's not what they're doing. So we have to, we have to remember that God created everything and he's in charge. That's the first principle. Second principle about God. God can do whatever he pleases. 
God can do whatever he pleases. Look at Psalm 115. Psalm 115. Psalm 115 and verse 3 says, But our God is in the heavens. He hath done whatsoever he hath pleased. God can do whatever he pleases. People get upset at some things in the Bible. They say, well, how, how can God do that? God's, God's not fair. God is one-sided. He's not fair. That's what people say. And they don't realize God is God, and God can do whatever he wants. And the things that he did in the Old Testament, he did for the perseverance of the people of Israel. Now, some of Israel wouldn't do what God said. God says, hey, go in and wipe them all out. And they wouldn't do it. Furthermore, whenever they didn't do it, those same people will come back and haunt them. Every time. Every time they disobey God, they will come, those people will come back because they didn't obey. God said, wipe them out. All of them, wipe them out. Right? God did things because of the perseverance of his people. And then God allowed things because of the sinfulness of man and the free will of man. I've had people ask me, how, how come God allows rape and stuff like that? God doesn't allow it. He's given mankind a free will, and they choose to do it. God doesn't sin. For God to, to sin, he would cease to be who? God. And we'd all be damned. No, he's still God. God can do whatever he wants to do, and whatever he does will be just and right. Third principle, it is only by God's grace we are here. It is only by God's grace we are here. Look at Lamentations. It's right after Jeremiah. Lamentations, chapter 3. Starting in verse 22. Lamentations 3, starting in verse 22. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed, because his passions fail not. It is only by God's grace that we are here. Look at verse 23. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. What's new every morning? His mercies. His compassion. They're new every morning. Look at verse 24. The Lord is my portion, saith my soul. Therefore will I hope in him. Do you realize that you will only hope in God if you make him your portion? If you don't make him your portion, you won't hope in him. You'll hope in yourself. Right? If we're not, if we're not making him the Lord of our life, and we're not making him our portion, and we're not making him our life, then we will not hope in him. We will hope in our ability. We will hope in our strength. We will hope in our wisdom. We will say, hey, look how smart I am. And God says, you're only smart because I gave you a brain. Right? The brain I have, God gave it to me. I'm not that smart either. But the, with the smarts that I do have, God gave it to me. The smarts that you have, God gave it to you. If you thank God for what the smarts that he's given you. We can always be smarter, right? We can always be dumber too. But God's given us a brain. We should thank him for it. Look at verse 25. The Lord is good unto them that wait for him, to the soul that seeketh him. You want God to be good to you? You want the goodness of God in your life? Then wait for him. Wait for him to do what? To work in your life. As you seek him, wait for him to work. As you seek him, wait for him to, to work in your heart, in your lives. You know what we should be praying? Lord, help me to have a soft heart. Help me to have a tender heart towards the things of you. Help me to be sensitive 
to the working of your Holy Spirit so that I can be more like you, so that I can uh, draw nigh to you and you can draw nigh to me. Uh, God is, we are only here because of God's grace. He has complete control over our lives. Nothing happens to us without God's permission. You ever realize that? Nothing happens to us without God's permission. Because he's sovereign. He's in control. We should be thankful that his love, that his mercy and compassion is new every morning. Every morning. Fourth principle, we'll close with this because I'm not going to go into the, to the second point because it's almost ten till. Fourth principle, God is interested in in us personally. He is interested in us. Every one of us. He's interested in the lost. How do I know that? Look at John chapter 3. John chapter 3. We're going to read a verse that almost everybody knows. Even the lost. John 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have what? Everlasting life. Do you know what the key word in, in that verse is? Whosoever. Y'all see that word? Whosoever. Who is God interested in? Everyone. He's interested in everyone. Whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Whosoever. God is interested. People say all the time, if God was a loving God, he wouldn't send anyone to hell. He doesn't. That's why he says, whosoever. God provided a way. For, for mankind to be reconciled back to him. It's called his son, Jesus Christ. So he provided a way. John 3, 16 answers this argument because it says, whosoever. So they can't say that. God sends no one to hell. People send themselves to hell. Because they say no to the free gift of God. They say no to his son. Go door knocking. I'm not interested. 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 That's the main answer out there in the world. I'm not interested. This was, or I don't have time. I don't have time. I don't have time. I'm going to a birthday party. What if you die at that birthday party? They don't have time. They're not interested. So how can they say it's God's fault? They can't say it's God's fault when they're the one saying, I'm not interested or I don't have time. No, it's their fault. People send themselves to hell because they don't have time to hear the truth or they're not interested in the truth. Right? Now, it's our job to get the truth out. It's our job to get the gospel out. It's our job to fulfill the Great Commission. We can't let those that say, I'm not interested... And we can't let those that say, I don't have time, stop us in our tracks. we got to keep going. Because you never know when you're going to find someone who is interested. You never know when you're going to find someone who says, yes, I want to hear. You never know when that's going to happen. So you keep going. And you're going to hear all kinds and, and multitudes of the wrong answer. I'm not interested. I don't have time. But eventually you're going to hear someone say, yeah, tell me more. And those are the blessings when that happens. Amen. So it's their choice. So he's, inter he's interested in the lost. He, he died for them. He suffered. He bled. He died for them. He was buried and rose the third day from the grave just for them. Just for the lost. He, he's interested in them. But you know what? He's also interested in every one of his people. Every one of us. He's interested in our lives. He, he wants to be in control because he knows that if he's in control, we're protected. And we'll honor him. And we'll please him. 
Look at Galatians 5. Galatians 5. And verse 13. It says, For brethren, you have been called unto liberty. Only use not your liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. See, liberty, we have liberty. We, we can do what we, we, we can choose what we're going to do. We have liberty to do that. God's not saying, hey, I have a hammer over your head. If you make the wrong decision, I'm going to beat you with it. He's not doing that. He's not. He wants us to freely, free will offering of ourselves to him so that he can use us. See, if we are doing it because we think we're forced to do it, it's not really service. Because it's not coming from the heart. It's coming from the flesh. And to be true service, it has to come from the heart and be spirit-led. Look at James 2. We'll close with this. James 2. In verse 18. It says, Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works. I will show thee my faith by my works. Now, my pen stopped working. Some people say, they'll take that, they'll take this passage, and they'll twist it. And they'll say, see, you, you got to work to be saved. It's not saying that at all. It's saying, if we as God's people are truly living by faith, that that faith will produce works. It's not works of salvation. He's talking to saved people. If it, was, if it was talking about salvation, he wouldn't be talking to saved people. He would be addressing the lost. But no, he, he's addressing a church. He's addressing his people, the saved. He said, hey, if, if you're living by faith, you're going to work. You're going to work for the Lord, and you're going to love it. You're going to love it. It's not going to be like work, Brother Chuck. When we're really loving Jesus, and we're living by faith, and we're serving him like we're supposed to be, we're enjoying it. We're enjoying it. It's when we're not really loving him. And we're not living by faith. And we're just going through duty. Going through motions. You can go door knocking. But if you're not doing it for the right reasons. You're not going to enjoy it. You can clean the church. But if you're going to do it for the right reason, You're not going to enjoy it. You can mow the yard. But if you're going to do it for the right reason, You're not going to enjoy it. See brother John. How can you enjoy mowing the yard? Because you're doing it for Jesus. You're doing it for the Lord. You're doing it because you're living by faith. And you're loving Jesus. And you enjoy pushing that lawnmower, even when it's 100 degrees outside. Now, I would recommend, men, that if it's 100 degrees outside, that you don't mow the yard when it's 100 degrees outside. You should wait, do it in the morning when it's 80, and not at 2 in the afternoon when it's 100. I don't want no one stroking out on me, because they were out there pushing the grass when it was 100 degrees. But if we did it, we would enjoy it. Even though we were be drenched in sweat, we would enjoy it because we were loving Jesus and we're living by faith and we wanted to serve him because our faith is producing works. And that's what James is saying. God is interested in his people. He wants to use each one of us. There's no one that he doesn't want to use. He wants to use all of us. And that's why there's a place in the body of Christ for all of us to be used for his honor and glory. Please stand up and have a very closed.